All right. Let's jump into uh, DNC 5. It's uh, incredibly enticing to teach DNC 5 and 17 together, so I'd highly recommend it. You don't have to, they don't actually happen close in time, just so closely tied in uh, the uh, content that it's very tempting, and so I'll illustrate doing it that way, but you don't have to do it this way. So uh, let's start with DNC 5. The context here, the storyline, is Brother Harris again. Now, so DNC 5, this is, uh, so Martin's back in Palmyra, living in Palmyra. He hasn't talked to Joseph since the last of the 116 pages. They're not on speaking terms. <laughs> uh, things, things have been a little icy between Joseph and Martin. Uh, I don't know the total extent to that, but uh, they're, they're just, the context of DNC 5 is the first time that they interact after the last 160 pages. And this happens if you look at your uh, section heading, this is March 1829. So has Joseph met Oliver Cowdery yet? No, Oliver will come next month. Okay, so that puts you back into a friend of mine. Oliver will come in April 1829. So right now, Emma is helping Joseph scribe a little bit. The gift has returned. Emma's helping a little. Now Martin shows up back down in Pennsylvania, in Harmony. The reason he shows up is because his wife is going a little crazy. Lucy Harris is now threatening lawsuits, not only against Joseph Smith, but against her own husband if he continues to be associated with this work. And so he is frantic to get some evidence, some, some greater witness that this really is from God, something... You know, we tried with 116 pages. Actually, Lucy Harris really liked that. When she saw the 116 pages, she actually was appreciative of that. Um, she was actually satisfied for a while about that. She actually went to a party. Uh, or they went out to another city, and Martin came back. She had allowed Martin to put her put the 116 pages in her bureau that had a special lock on it. Uh, but apparently, Martin didn't have the key, and when uh, his wife was gone, and someone else came along, not one of the five mentioned in the covenantal contract they made. This part where Martin's breaking his covenant. And they wanted to see it. He said, I'll show it to you. And he tried to open the burrow, and he couldn't. And without being pretty aggressive, then he actually like breaks it to some degree. That's what really just peeved Lucy Harris. When she got back and saw that he had like messed with her sacred burrow, that's when she like was like, she, she gave, him a, gave him a tongue lashing, and uh, uh, she is against the work of uh, of the Book of Mormon. Seems like from that point on, it seems like a silly little thing, but uh, that's the point where you can mark when she's just like angry, angry, angry. Lucy Max Smith, in this book says that uh, Lucy Harris gets on her horse and rides up and down the neighborhood like a dark spirit, uh, trying to uh, convince people. Uh, turn their minds against Joseph Smith and the whole process, and finding anybody in the neighborhood who could somehow attest to the fact that Joseph is a fraud. Is, is there anyone that can that can bring forth evidence that in a court of law would would prove that he is is fraudulent? Martin Harris, if he continues to associate with Joseph, is going to be you know complicit to that, and therefore would also be subject to the lawsuits. So this is the context. Martin is actually frantic. For help. He comes down to Joseph and he says, Joseph, is there any way that I could see the plates? Is there any way I could get like further witness? Which tells you what, during the entire translation, 116 pages, Martin did not see the plates. During the process, he didn't see the plates. Right? He hasn't seen them yet. And so Joseph says, uh, I don't know, let's inquire. So section five is frantic Martin wanting another witness, a deeper witness, a greater witness, so that he can be 100% sure that his association with Joseph, even if it leads to you know, legal problems, is okay. That he's on the winning team, that he's not being duped, that he's not you know, being frauded out of his money. It's interesting that after 116 pages of... It's interesting he would still want more. Oh, yeah. This isn't his last time. Wouldn't you though? Like, Shelf life. I would want to. Like, I'd want to see him. Your wife is like on your case. Well, even if she wasn't on my case, it's like I'd really like to see those plates. Plates. Yeah. yeah. 
But he doesn't understand why. He doesn't but he, like, why can't I is he coming it? here to see the plates, or is he coming here just wanting? Yeah, good. Re re reverse one for us, Parker. So now let's go to content here. In the content. And I say unto you that my servant Martin Harris has desired a witness at my hand that you, my servant Joseph Jr., have got the plates of which you have testified and borne record that you have received. So he does want the plates. Yeah, he wants to, well, as he put it, you want a witness, witness. that Joseph has the plates. <laughs> and it would be really good if he could actually see the plates. That would be a witness that Joseph actually has the plates. Uh, notice that the Lord is speaking to Joseph directly, not Martin Harris. It's kind of a cool third person speak. Joseph, tell Martin that. <laughs> there's, there's, there's still kind of that iciness from the 160 pages here. Um, and uh, I believe, let me see, later on, uh, does he. No, yeah, I think through the whole thing, maybe. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty sure the whole section he just talks to Joseph about Martin. Um, <laughs> Even like verse 26, I, the Lord, command him, my servant Martin Harris, that he shall be etc. So, yep, this is all in that, that voice. Uh, interesting. So, Martin, uh, let's let's look at the content of the NC5. We're going to dabble a little bit 17. Because the Lord lays it out like this. Here's how I graph or, or kind of lay out the plan. The Lord says, that's interesting, Martin, that you would want to be a witness because uh, I actually need witnesses. I actually have a plan that incorporates witnesses. Uh, and uh, this is kind of how he lays it out. So I would, I would lay out the first witness of the Book of Mormon. We're going to talk about wit Book of Mormon witnesses here. The first witness of the Book of Mormon in DNC 17, and we'll talk context to that in just a second. Sorry, we're going to the content first. But, uh, the, first the first witness, the Lord says, is himself. What's his phrase? And DNC 76, he says, uh, As your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. So let's put the Lord as witness number one. As your Lord and your God liveth, that book is true. Back in section 5, verse 2, who is the, who we maybe call the second witness of the Book of Mormon. According to verse 2, who is commanded to stand as a witness of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. Jesus. That would be Joseph Smith. That's in verse 10. Uh, 10 as well as 17.5 uh, that Joseph is going to be the Lord's mouthpiece. He's going to be the witness of the Book of Mormon. But then verse 11 through 13, interesting, uh, the Lord says, In addition to your testimony, Joseph, the testimony of three of my servants whom I shall call and ordain unto whom I will show these things, they shall go forth with my words that are given through you. They shall know of a surety that these things are true. For from heaven will I declare it unto them. I will give them power that they may behold and view these things as they are. So I actually have a plan to have three witnesses join your witness, Joseph, which we could add to the witness of the Savior as the witness of the Book of Mormon. And the plan is, verse 15, the testimony of these three witnesses will I send forth of my word, uh, and it would be in conjunction with the Book of Mormon, that would go together with my word, of my word, to mankind. There's mankind. Uh, in verse 16, Behold, whosoever believeth on my words, then will I visit with the manifestation of my spirit. They will be born of me in the water and the spirit, uh, even of water and spirit. And uh, verse 18, their testimony, meaning the testimony of the three, shall also go forth unto the condemnation of this generation if they harden their hearts against them. So the testimony of these three will go forth with the Word of God, either to the blessing or the condemnation of all humanity. I actually have a master plan that incorporates witnesses. Funny you should ask Martin that uh, you'd like a witness of actually seeing the plates. So, I will tell you how to do this. Here is how you gain a witness of the Book of Mormon. Here's how you become a witness of the Book of Mormon. Uh, will you just quickly identify the principles here? The Lord teaches Martin Harris. I'm just going to write them up here as you yell them out. Uh, really? What What does he tell them they're going to need? Or mm -hmm. to, does he tell Martin Harris he's going to need? Humility. Good. You must. 
Sincere, yourself. sincere and mighty prayer. Oh no, <laughs> mighty prayer, sincere heart. Mighty prayer, sincere heart. Knowledge is wrong doings. Good, so we call that repentance. What else? Anything else? Keep commandments. Feel free to uh, jump over to 17, because this is to the other two witnesses in conjunction with Martin. He's going to talk about that there. Keep commandments. Faith again. And faith is mentioned <coughs> twice. We'll square that one. Three times. Right. Cubit. Cubit is the distance between your elbow and your <coughs> How much is that? Faith cubit. It's three times bigger than normal cubit. Faith. Uh, and I faith one more time. There's one more. Is it, is it really? Testify. That you've it's seen in verse there two. There it is. That's the one. Verse three. Say it again, Mark. Testify that you've seen them. Testify. You're going to have an obligation to testify oh, okay. gotcha. that you have the witness. Right. So there, there's the formula uh, that was laid out for Mark. And then he's actually told specifically how not to gain a witness. Right? Chapter 5, verse 7. It's the very way he thinks he should get a witness. Yeah, believe. Ironically. Verse 7 says what? Uh, Brian, read it for us. They would not believe in my words. They would not believe you, my servant Joseph. If it were possible that you should show unto them all things which I have com committed unto you. And just speaking of the children of men generally, verse 6, if you show them all these things, that's not going to make them believe you. Even if it were possible for you to show them. Um... That's interesting, right? External evidence will not convince someone who does not believe the words of the Book of Mormon and is not willing to pay the price to receive the spiritual witness. Uh, let me give you a case in point. Case in point. There was once a man who saw the plates. His name was John Whitmer. John Whitmer, one of the eight witnesses, became uh, apostate in Far West. And uh, he was actually confronted on this, the fact that he had seen the plates and yet he left the church. What the heck? So, 1839, uh, his former friend Theodore Turley openly accused him of being inconsistent. Answering in the presence of his new anti Mormon friends, John Weber said, Well, I now say, we, yeah, I handled those plates. There were fine engravings on both sides. I handled them. Turley then bluntly asked him why he now doubted the work, to which Whitmer replied, Well, I couldn't read it. I don't know whether the translation is true or not. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, like, that's something like the best evidence of the actual existence of the place that there is. Negative yeah. testimony <laughs> by an apostate in front of his anti Mormon buddies. He's like, well, Yeah, I read it, but I, or I could hold it, but I couldn't read it. So like, I don't know what I said. It's amazing. That's verse 7 to a T, right? Even if you should show them these things, that's not they're not going to believe. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, all right, let's go context to these. So Martin Harris has his homework. Here's his homework. By the way, uh, if you are going to suggest and teach someone how to gain a witness, the Book of Mormon is true. Just seem like what you might teach them. Mm -hmm. You might add, read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> it, all the recovery haven't even arrived yet. We're still in the process of that. Right? Everything's fine. By the way, it was actually during this time, right? When this visit of Martin Harris, when Joseph let him actually scribe a little bit more, and it was during that time that they took a little break. And they went out to do something, maybe skip rocks or something, we don't know, where he found another rock that kind of looked like the Yermadamum, the, the seer stone, and he uh, got that rock, swapped it out in Joseph's hat. Joseph went back to translating, and what does he say? You know, this famous line, he looks at it and he says, Martin. Still my what have you done? All is as dark as Egypt. <laughs> Martin's like kind of sheepish. He's like, yeah, sorry. I just uh, I just wanted to shut the mouths of fools, Joseph. People are saying you're like memorizing like long texts, and I, I knew that wasn't true. 
So I just wanted to shut the mouth of fools. And sorry, about, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, he was doing. His, he had his own little schemes of how to try to make sure, kind of prove that Joseph wasn't just making stuff up, just memorizing. I've heard some people theorize that maybe the seer stones were nothing special at all. Maybe they were just Joseph, just honestly thought that they were working. And so they did because he thought it. It's the dum Dumbo's feather philosophy, uh, theory uh, of seer stones. And uh, of course, that, that story right there shows that's not the case. The seer stones actually were legit. The seer stones themselves had some, that were infused with some divine power of some kind. Otherwise, if Joseph earnestly thought, then that rock would have worked, right? But it did not. And so that, that, that's a nice case study to, to debunk that idea of the Dumbo's feather theory of translation. I just came up with that. I like that title. <laughs> Dumbo's <laughs> theory. As long as you believe it, then it works. Let's go to DNC 17. Now, in time, like I said, this is separated by a few months. Let's see how much time goes by. What are we in June of DNC 17? So. So from March to June, that's quite the span. Anything significant happened between those two points? <laughs> yeah, only the entire Book of Mormon has been translated now, right? Between March and June. And uh, so by by section 17, either the entire Book of Mormon's done translation, with done, totally translated, or there's like a tiny bit more, maybe another day or two. But this is like mid-June, the Book of Mormon is in, it, it ends mid-June. Uh, they're done in mid-June, and so so sometime right around this time is when the Book of Mormon is complete. And uh, they have noticed, as they've been translating the Book of Mormon, it keeps talking about there's three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God. By the way, uh, Joseph has moved from Harmony, Pennsylvania now up to uh, Fayette. The Whitmers have uh, invited Joseph up because the persecution was starting to get more heavy down in Pennsylvania. He needed a safe place to translate again. Oliver wrote up and asked uh, David Whitmer what he thought about the possibility of them coming there. David Whitmer said that's great. So Joseph has been up there. They're finishing the small plates up in Fayette. And uh, this came up one time in 2 Nephi 27. Where else does it come up in the Book of Mormon? Remember? Do you remember this? Uh, no, there's also another one in Ether 5. Which one of these would Joseph have seen first? Ether. Ether. Ether 5, right? And then would have gone back around to the small plates. Uh, and so... Uh, the very first time three witnesses are ever mentioned would have been DNC 5, right? Because this comes in March before either Ether or uh, 2nd Nephi 27. So the very first concept that there would be three witnesses is here. Now, fast forward to June. Book of Mormon's done. They've read these. Uh, now, as the Book of Mormon is reaching its completion, there are, uh, there are people interested in kind of seeing what the next step is. Even Joseph's parents, Lucy and Joseph Sr., have come from Palmyra to Fayette. They're all together there. And uh, it, it comes to pass that uh, they bring up this three witness idea in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Martin, David, and Oliver uh, ask if it could be them. DNC 17 tells them that what? If you abide by the laws of, witness, of how to become the witnesses, then absolutely, then, then you might see them. Not only would you see the place, though, verse 1 says you could also see what else? Here's the list. Yeah, this is the show and tell right here. It's also the, pl the breastplate, sort of labor, your thumb. Uh, what else? The miraculous directors of Lehi, Leahona. Uh, they're they're going to see several things. By their faith, they will be they will obtain a view of them. Uh, but then they will be under obligation to do what? Testify. Verse five: You should, you shall testify that you have seen them. That's that's the condition. Here. You must testify, right? And if you do that, then the gates of hell will not prevail against you. If you don't, then they will. So aftermath of D N C seventeen. Lucy, Max Smith remembers this. She says. After attending morning service, namely reading, singing, and praying, Joseph arose from his knees and approached Martin with a solemnity which thrills through my veins to this day, whenever it comes to my recollection. Martin Harris, he said, you have got to humble yourself before God this day and obtain, if possible, forgiveness of your sins. Still hasn't fully applied BNC 5. 
If you will do this, it is God's will that you and Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer should look upon the plates. Soon after this, these four left and went into a grove a short distance from the house. Here's the house. Out back is a grove. You can kind of see a little grove back there. Um, Joseph also says they retire to the woods, into the woods behind the house, somewhere in these woods. Outer space shows you all the options. <laughs> Anywhere in these woods, we're not sure exactly where. What's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like a camel. Yeah, the camel horse. Upside down? Okay, okay. with those really pointy camel. humps. No, those are legs. Oh, those are legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Symbolism <laughs> um, here. Astounding. And the burden it would be to uh, <laughs> be a witness. <laughs> Rich man. This is one of those Rorschach tests. What do you guys see camel. in the shape of trees? That tells you a lot about yourself. I see. The gold plates. Oh! oh. You're so faithful. So, uh, they go into the woods to know what happens. What happens? Here they are. Uh, this this artist, oh, it looks like they missed one, right? There were four witnesses. Joseph plus three. Come on, artist. Wait, no, what happened? You know the story? Aftermath, what happens? They start to pray. Joseph says, let's take turns praying. Joseph starts. They each take a turn to pray. They did that twice or three times. Nothing happened, was Joseph said. Or what happened? Was <laughs> Mark feels like he's the one that's. <laughs> it's, like, it's my bad. I, I, it's my problem. Right? If you'll humble yourself this day and seek forgiveness, uh, he's like, let me let me withdraw. As soon as he withdraws, they try again. Does it work? Mm -hmm. It does. Proving that he was he the problem. Mm -hmm. He was. Yes, uh, and it's not just the plates, but just as verse one said, uh, David Whitmer says they got to see. Not only those plates, but also, uh, I think he said the brass plates as well. Yeah. Many records of plates, besides the plates of the Mormon, also mm -hmm. sort of Laban, the directors, the interpreters. Um, yeah, Joseph goes out and finds Martin, tells him what happened, they pray together, eventually, same thing happens, right? Uh, Joseph sees it all again. Martin uh, says, It is enough, it is enough, I have seen, my eyes have seen. And you can imagine with all the buildup and all the anxiety and all the stress and pressure in Martin's life, how beautiful that moment was. When they came home, Lucy says, Joseph just threw himself on the bed. He's like, Mother. He said, he's just so relieved, right? He's like, Mother, now there are others that know I do not go about to deceive this people. Uh, beautiful moment. And Martin started testifying. He's like, I have seen. Lucy recorded how excited he was. Uh, shortly thereafter, the, it's drafted, their, their witnesses drafted that will go into the Book of Mormon. Do you mind reading for us, Steve? Just start right here. Yeah, right there. And then, uh, the Testament. Oh, the main, uh, the main. Uh, you know. To all nations, kindred stuff. Can you read I have it memorized, actually. <laughs> Be it known unto, used to say, every, but they decided that all was better. Oh, man. Uh, Bold move. Nations. <laughs> Uh, here's a better, uh, or another version, not a better. Um, notice that I want to just highlight the, you, you've read it, the content I think you're very familiar with, but notice how much they highlight they have seen, uh, they heard the voice of God, we have seen, uh, our eyes, they were laid before our eyes, we saw, we beheld, uh, we beheld, the voice of the Lord commanded us. They actually don't just see plates and angels, but they also hear God's voice speaking, right? Uh, and then they sign their names to that, knowing that if they are faithful in Christ, they will rid their garments of the blood of all men. Like verse 8 says uh, in the last part of DNC 17, that the gates of hell would not prevail against them. Now, uh, shortly after this, uh, Joseph goes to Palmyra, and uh, right behind his house in the sacred grove, is where he gets the eight witnesses. The eight witnesses are able to see the plates. What's interesting is that who is doing the showing with the three witnesses? Moroni. Moroni. Who has the plates? Moroni. Mm -hmm. Joseph goes to Palmyra. Does Joseph have the plates? No. He goes to the sacred grove. Does he have the plates? No. Eight witnesses are right here. He says, hold on a second. Comes back with the plates. He's like, okay. And he lays the plates. Where did he get the plates? <laughs> that was awesome, right? So a little, maybe a little meeting with Moroni. We don't know exactly, but he got he gets the plates. Just comes out with the plates, and they're all able to heft, hold, flip, and see the careful, intricate engravings. And 
And uh, here's another they one. Couldn't they, they, could, they, they couldn't read them. They couldn't read them, so they don't know, right? Know. I mean, who knows? I know if it's true. Who knows? Yeah, how are you supposed to know? It's, it's, you can't read that. that. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, they, they, they bear witness that Smith has got the plates of which he hath said he hath got. Uh, it's not a bunch of lead or a bunch of sand, as some people said, in a box. It's other people it's like real plates. Good. Now, here's, here's what used to trouble me about this. Uh, how many of them fell away were excommunicated? All three, the three, three of the uh, eight. We looked at John. Uh, how many of them came back? Two. This column's significant, right? The implications of, of this are awesome. Uh, how many of them stayed true to their witness? We saw John Whitmer even in a very antagonistic moment where he could have like tried to like just deny the whole thing. Actually. Verified it in a super good way. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the three witnesses, the fact that, that uh, these three men eventually are excommunicated or estranged from the church, I think shows, again, God's omniscience. I think he chose the three witnesses very, very well. Uh, what do we mean by that? Why were they like the perfect candidates? Especially mm -hmm. knowing their futures and the fact that they would follow it or that they would waver in other aspects of their testimony, but not the Book of Mormon. Why is that valuable? Uh, yeah. Isn't it, is it kind of what you were saying before with John Whitmer, that it, even, it actually strengthens it, that they never denied it, yeah. even though they still fell away? I think that, yeah. I don't know if he like, was hoping that, but like knowing that he would know that, it would solidify the truth, the truth even more. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, if this is a, if this is a fraud, are these three in on it? They have to be on it, don't they? If this is a fraud, do they know that it's a fraud after having written their testimony? If this work is a fraud, they are complicit, amen? Yep. They, they claim to know too much to just say, you know, just believe. No. They said, we heard the voice of God, we saw an angel. If, if, if this is all a lie, then they're liars too. True? Mm -hmm. So, uh, here's President, President Eyring says this. He says that, that this strengthens the fact that they did not deny. Listen to this, President Iron. The three witnesses never denied their testimony of the Book of Mormon. They could not because they knew it was true. They made sacrifices and faced difficulties beyond what most people ever know. Oliver Cadre gave the same testimony about the divine origin of the Book of Mormon as he lay dying. But in the times of trial, they wavered in their faith that Joseph was still God's prophet, and that the only way to come unto the Savior was through his restored church. That they continued to affirm what they saw and heard in that marvelous experience during long periods of estrangement from the church and from Joseph makes their testimony more powerful. Yeah, love that. If Joseph is lying, they know it, and when they're be, when they become antagonistic to Joseph for reasons that we could talk about and we will talk about later, uh, they had the perfect chance, didn't they? Just pull a rug out from underneath this whole operation and bring the whole, the whole fraudulent enterprise crashing. Right? But instead, they continued to affirm. Let me give you some examples of this. Uh, so Thomas B. Marsh, he was one of those that, uh, he was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will also... Uh, be excommunicated, he'll fall away from the church. Uh, he largely joined the church because of the witness of the three witnesses. And so now when he was out of the church and they were out of the church, he thought, now's my chance. So in his own record he said, I inquired seriously at David Whitmer if it was true that he had seen the angel according to his testimony as one of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. He replied, as sure as there is a God in heaven, he saw the angel according to his testimony in that book. I asked him, well, if so, how did he not stand now stand by Joseph? He answered that in the days when Joseph received the Book of Mormon and brought it forth, he was a good man, filled with the Holy Ghost. But he considered he had now fallen. I interrogated Oliver Cowdery in the same manner, who answered me similarly. So no denial of the actual experience with the angel, the book, but uh, Joseph kind of went off the tracks. That was their feeling. Uh, this is a cool handwritten account. 
uh, a letter that David Whitmer wrote. This is 1887 now, so 50 years after he left the church. Uh, but uh, someone was asking about his he's, he's by far the most interviewed <coughs> witness. Because why? He never came back. He lives the longest. <laughs> the other one's died to her. Uh, but uh, here's, uh, let's zoom in here. He says, I did see the angel as it is recorded in my testimony in the Book of Mormon. The book is true, underlines, is true. He's been out of the church for 50 years. He did not see an incongruity in believing the Book of Mormon, but discounting Joseph and the church. And although we might say that's a little insane, uh, he, that actually is perfect for a Book of Mormon witness, right? As far as validating the truthfulness of his, of his experience. I did see the angel, that book is true. Uh, but if you look here in the, in the fine print, <laughs> it says, The gathering to Jackson County, Missouri, however, I think uh, was too hasty. And uh, he goes on to do like, I think Joseph made some mistakes. But as far as the Book of Mormon and the Angel, thank you. That's awesome. So good. Um, so I had a home teaching companion who left the church. I wrote him a letter asking him about what about a bunch of stuff, you know. What about the Book of Mormon? What about the three witnesses? What about this? What about that? Just kind of how, how could you throw it all away? Here's what he said about the three witnesses. He said, uh, about three witnesses, even you know, Scott, that these men saw the plates of God and not of man. They saw the plates in a vision, not in real life. This, this is 100% the only argument against the three witnesses out there by anti-Mormons or by those who don't believe them, is that in their accounts they say, according to this argument. They only say they saw them in vision, they only say they saw them with spiritual eyes, and therefore they can't be trusted. That's actually led a lot of people to question the whole veracity of the whole enterprise and led them to leave the church as well. Like this is a CES letter kind of attack. Thankfully, that nonsense was actually brought forth while the three witnesses were alive. <laughs> so they actually had a chance to respond to that. That's what the anti don't usually tell you, is that they actually responded to this. <coughs> so, uh, for example, Martin Harris. Martin Harris was once asked by a group, uh, I think it was high priests, did you really see him like with your physical eyes? Like, did you actually see him for real? The angel the plates. He, uh, he held up his hand and he said, Gentlemen, do you see that hand? Are you sure you see it? Are your eyes playing a trick or something? No? <laughs> huh? Well, as sure as you see my hand, so sure did I see the angel and the plates. So that's pretty good. There's another one, uh, a bunch of youth. I think this is up in Utah, up in the uh, Logan area, where he would later live. Uh, a bunch of youth are like, did you, Mr. Harris, did you actually see? Or just like, sort of see? You know? There was like a chopping block over on the side of the road. He's like, you see that chopping block? And they're like, yeah. And he says, well, just as plain as you see that chopping block, I saw the plates. And sooner than I would deny it, I would lay my head on that chopping block and let you chop it off. <laughs> it's pretty gross. But how old was he then? Very good. He's an old man, so he could, you could, yeah, he probably looked like that. <laughs> um, that's what I would guess. That time. A little bad head. Uh, Oliver Cowdery. Oh, another fun story I don't have on here, but another fun story is uh, his buddies got him drunk, okay? They got Martin Harris drunk because, uh, well, the word of wisdom was still the word of wisdom, okay? Not Lord of Command with it. So they got him, they got him, got him a little tipsy, and they're like, all right, Martin. He's like, do you honestly believe that you saw an angel? He's like, no, no, no. They're like, oh, And he's like, I absolutely know I saw him! So he comes back even more <laughs> Where's that story at? Uh, it's got word that word. Uh, that was the day that picture was taken. Right? Probably, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's under uh, three witnesses. Like Mordecai. 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 What's that? That actually was true. That's, That's a true story. story. Okay. I don't tell you false stories. It's not Woodward.org. It's true. Yeah. It's just as true as. Do you see my hand? What is it true? Let's do some Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery said, I beheld with my eyes, and I handled with my hands, the gold plates from which it was translated. I also saw with my eyes and handled with my hands the holy interpreters. That book is true. Uh, 
David Whitmer has some of the best ones. Uh, one time, someone was trying to suggest to him when he was kind of laying down, relaxing. Like, are you sure you didn't just kind of like hallucinate? Maybe it was like a shared hallucination, you know? Maybe it was a mental disturbance of some kind. And he's like, like pups, you know, like very aware, sits up, <clears throat> says in solemn and impressive tones, No, sir, I was not under any hallucination, nor was I deceived. I saw with these eyes, and I heard with these ears. I know whereof I speak. Here's another one. Uh, when he's interviewed, he said, I saw them just as plain as I see this bed. Striking the bed beside him with his hand. I think this is over some Pratt interviewing him. I heard the voice of the Lord as distinctly as I ever heard anything in my life, declaring that the records of the place of Book of Mormon were translated by the gift and power of God. Our testimony, as recorded in the Book of Mormon, is strictly and absolutely true, just as it is there written. Um, so good, so good. So for more testimonies like these, Elder Dr. Orr, but more witnesses, free witnesses, literal witnesses. So good. All right. <laughs> uh, now, here's, here's kind of the punchline, I think, for as far as uh, the three witnesses go. This is what I would, you know. Now, we haven't talked about application yet at all with our students or anything like that. This story is just interesting, isn't it? It's just rich and relevant because it's about a church and a, and a prophet and the people that I love. Um, as far as like application, I only dropped this little bit with the three witnesses. Uh, I love this quote from Austin Farrar. He was not talking about the three witnesses. He was talking about C.S. Lewis and how good he was at arguing for Christianity. But hopefully we can see a connection here. He says, though argument does not create conviction, lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. Super good. I would paraphrase it like this. Though evidence does not create conviction, lack of destroys belief. External evidence for the Book of Mormon will not create belief, but it, I believe the Lord is doing something with the three witnesses to maintain a climate in which belief may flourish, to keep the wolves at bay, right? So they can't just have a heyday on the Book of Mormon. I think that the external witnesses of the Book of Mormon uh, allow people to take the Book of Mormon seriously enough that they will gain an internal witness right, through the power of the Holy Ghost. But in our day, you remember the spectrum of enchantment to enlightenment and rationalism? I think that the three witnesses is a nod to the rationalism uh, era in which we live. We need stuff like that. Our day and age needs like hard evidence. We need witnesses. That works for us and God speaks to us in our language. And so I think this is an example of him doing exactly that to help maintain a climate in which belief may flourish. Um, so that is DNC 5, DNC 17. Uh, beautiful. I think it's powerful stuff. The, the three witnesses, um, the formula. Um, yeah. This is how I've gotten a testimony in the Book of Mormon. Uh, but external witnesses totally helped me to uh, take it seriously. Uh, chiasmus is great if it helps you to uh, humble yourself enough to get your own witness. You know, internal evidence, external evidence, great. So you can get your own personal witness from the Holy Ghost. Uh, yeah, but bear my witness of the Book of Mormon and of uh, Christ and his role in the restoration and bringing it forth. I am convinced that it's true. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. amen.